archaeologist, philosopher, bonsai aficionado, author, black belt, and squanderer of over 50,000 hours watching B-movies. He uses this wealth of useless knowledge to bring you classic movie reviews with snark and world-famous short summaries. Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Classic Movie Reviews with Snark. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. This movie is one of my all-time favorites. It's the fourth of the October 2015 films. The Omega Man 1971 is an adaptation of the 1964 novel I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Maybe the boogeymen don't measure up to modern standards, but legendary actor Charlton Heston sets the bar for post-apocalyptic survival. Charlton Heston played the role of Neville, presumed to be the last human alive. Heston was born in 1924 in Illinois. While in high school, he joined the theater program and made a 16mm version of Pier Gint, 1941. He worked in the local community theater and received a scholarship to Northwestern. His next film was a sound version of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, 1950. With just a few small parts under his belt, Heston was cast as a circus manager in director Cecil B. DeMille's The Greatest Show on Earth, 1952. His co-stars in the film were Jimmy Stewart, Cornell Wilde, and Betty Hutton. After this strong showing, he was a busy actor. He has acted in almost every genre, but I can't recall a comedy. He was cast as a man that could stand against any odds. He starred in The Naked Jungle, 1954, as a plantation owner trying to save his home from a two-mile-wide army of ants. He teamed up with DeMille again for The Ten Commandments, 1956, and was cast as none other than Moses. Heston delivered a great performance as a Mexican detective in the film noir masterpiece Touch of Evil, 1958, with Orson Welles. He starred with Gregory Peck in The Big Country, 1958, a western. In one of my favorite films, The Buccaneer, 1958, he played General Andrew Jackson along with Yul Brynner as pirate Jean Lafitte and Inger Stevens as the governor's daughter. It is hard to say what would be his greatest role, but Judah, the falsely accused Jewish prince in Ben-Hur, 1955, is in the top ten. Following much of his earlier work, he continued to play roles that featured him as a real historical figure. These movies include playing the title role in El Cid, 1961, playing an American officer fighting in the Boxer Revolution in 55 Days at Peking, 1963, playing John the Baptist in The Greatest Story Ever Told, 1965, cast as painter, not turtle, Michelangelo, struggling against the Pope, played masterfully by Rex Harrison in The Agony and the Ecstasy, 1965, and as English General China Gordon trying to save a besieged city in Khartoum, 1966. Heston returned to Westerns with Will Penny, 1967. Heston said that this was his favorite film work in later interviews, but he was about to take off in another direction in a series of dystopian science fiction films. In the first of these films, he played astronaut out of time Taylor in Planet of the Apes, 1968. I guess he had the first human-ape on-screen kiss as well. Heston made a brief appearance in Beneath the Planet of the Apes, 1970. These two ape films were followed by The Omega Man, 1971. Finally, he starred in Soylent Green, 1973, which was Edward G. Robinson's last movie, and it co-starred the rifleman Chuck Connor. Heston was active in other genres as well, including two disaster movies, Airport, 1975, made in 1974, and Earthquake, 1974, which had since around. Other great roles were in Midway, 1976, also in Sense Around, and in Grey Lady Down, 1978. I said he didn't have a comedy film earlier, but I have to back off a little. He played the good gas station actor in Wayne's World 2, 1993, and as an eyepatch-wearing agency boss in Schwarzenegger's True Lies, 1994. Heston died in 2008 at the age of 84. Anthony Zerby played the leader of the family, Matthias. Zerby was born in California in 1936. As an adult, he served in the Air Force before heading to New York to study acting. Zerby's film debut was with Heston in Will Penny, 1967. He had a small part as a minor in the Molly Maguires, 1970, in the Omega Man, 1971, 
as a hustler in the life and times of Judge Roy Bean, 1972, a leper colony leader in Papillon, 1973, and a lawman turned bad in Rooster Cogburn, 1975. Zerbe did some television work in the early 70s as well. In a movie I have never seen, Zerbe played a mad scientist in Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, 1978, an unconcerned father in the Dead Zone, 1983, a sadistic perv in Opposing Forces, 1986, as a guy sucked out of an airlock in License to Kill, 1989, a guy that was killed by face-stretching in Star Trek Insurrection, 1998, and as Counselor Hammond in The Matrix Reloaded, 2003, and The Matrix Revolution, 2003. He had a small role in American Hustle, 2013. Rosalind Cash played leader of the other humans, Lisa. Cash had a decent career, but most of it was in television. Her only notable movies are The Omega Man, 1971, Uptown Saturday Night with Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier, and Cornbread Earl and Me, 1975. Really, I just wanted to say Cornbread Earl and Me. Paul Coslow was cast in the role of Dutch. Coslow's first film was Little White Crimes, 1966. He was cast in a lot of movies during the 1970s. These films include one of my all-time favorites, Vanishing Point, 1971, and, of course, The Omega Man, 1971. Western film Joe Kidd, 1972. Black exploitation film Cleopatra Jones, 1973. The Stone Killer, 1973. And Mr. Majestic, 1974, where he tried to strong-arm melon grower Charles Bronson. Bad move. Through the 1980s, he worked in television, and the 1990s were marked with straight-to-video roles. Eric Lanyaville played the role of Richie. Born in New Orleans in 1952, Lanyaville played a hip youth in the Omega Man 1971 and A Force of One 1979 with Chuck Norris. He played the same as he aged in three television shows, Room 222 from 1970-73, The White Shadow from 1979-80, to and Sane Elsewhere from 1982-88. to Story Of the three films based on the novel I Am Legend, the Omega Man 1971 drifts the furthest from the story, and I think it's the most enjoyable. The movie begins with Neville, Charlton Heston, driving through L.A. on a sunny day without a care in the world. The top is down on his convertible, and he has sunglasses on. He is listening to jazz on his 8-track. That's an iPod for you youngsters. Everything changes when he sees a shadowy figure move behind a window. He pulls out a machine gun and fires before driving on. As the credits roll, they begin to show the dead bodies and destroyed property. It becomes clear that no one else is around. Neville takes a corner too fast and wrecks his car. There's never a cop around when you need one. He's wearing a safari jacket, two pistols, and a knife. He walks to a car dealership, and we learn that something happened in 1975. He has a conversation with a dead sales manager before driving out through the window. Huh? All right, how much you give me in trade for my Ford? Really? Thanks a lot, you cheating bastard. Remember I said this scene was stolen from The World, the Flesh, and the Devil, 1959. Neville takes his convertible Mustang to the theater, where he watches Woodstock, 1970. Neville says it's been held over for three years, giving the time frame that he has been alone. He hooks up a generator and sits back to enjoy the movie. When he leaves the theater, he looks at the sun and then his watch. He panics, and then all the phones in town start ringing. Yes, there used to be phone booths on the street. He has to convince himself that they are not ringing. Then he says it's almost night. They'll be waking up soon. He races back to his house. As he opens his garage door, robed albino figures pour flames from above, leap into his car, and try to run past his automatic gunfire. Why are they wearing robes? Who knows, but they're good day and night wear, and are warm in the winter and cool in the summer. If you're going out at night, just put on a string of pearls, so why not? Neville makes it into the house after killing three. When he starts his generator, the lights force the family members outside away. As Neville rides up in the elevator, a nuclear war between China and Russia is shown in flashback. The news is reported by Jonathan Mathias, Anthony Zerby. One side or the other uses biological weapons. When the elevator reaches the penthouse, everything is back in current time. Neville has a conversation with a bust of Caesar in a purple robe and an army head. For you, I think it's your move. 
Join me. Hmm. Miserable schmuck. It is clear that Neville is insane. About this time, Neville hears the family outside laughing and carrying on. goes to the balcony to see what they're going to destroy tonight. They taunt him, calling him Neville as they burn books and art. The leader of the family is none other than the TV reporter, now called just Matthias. Matthias laments about the death of the family members and the fact that the whole family can't bring down one man. His second-in-command, Zachary, Lincoln Kilpatrick, calls it a honky paradise and Matthias begs him to forget the old ways. The light. They should have stayed clear of the light. There was no light, brother, just the fire. Nonsense. Neville can't see in the dark. Tell him that. Any more than we can see in the light. The hell he sees. Good enough, he sees. And yet the whole family can't bring him down out of that. That hunky paradise, brother. Forget the old ways, brother. All the old hatreds, all the old pains. Forget and remember. The family is one. The family is anti-technology. Zachary wants to use modern tools, but Matthias says it will bring back the plague. Matthias flashes back to his news reporting in the beginning of the plague. The people are dying so fast that nothing can be done. It is at this point we learn that Neville is really U.S. Army Colonel Robert Neville, M.D., and he's working on a vaccine at the end. He is transporting version 97B-71, when the pilot of his helicopter dies of the plague and they crash. Neville is also showing signs of the disease, so he gives himself the vaccine, making himself the only one that is completely immune. Back in modern time, the family brings up a catapult and begins shooting fireballs at Neville's house. Dressed in a hunter green velvet smoking jacket, he opens up on them with an automatic rifle using a starlight scope to aim into the dark. Sometime later, he is out for a jog slash hunt. He can't do too much cardio, and he goes to a department store to get some new workout gear. He spots an African-American woman with a giant Angela Davis afro pretending to be a mannequin. When he speaks to her, she runs out. After chasing her for a while, he decides that he was hallucinating again. This how it starts. A trip to the Laughing Academy. Now, you silly bastard, it starts with you asking yourself idiot questions. <sighs> right. Right. <sighs> okay. Let's get cleaned up. <sighs> and find a drink before the bars close. Later, the family catches Neville by pushing a wine rack over on him. He has an affinity for good scotch, so he was hanging around the cellar. The family, with Matthias as judge, gives him a quick trial and sentences him to be discarded. Neville and Matthias have a talk in the side room. Matthias calls him the angel of death and gives him the family manifesto. Well, Mr. Neville, now we can talk a little while. It's been a long time since you've talked, except to yourself. <sighs> Tell me something, would you? Are you fellas really with the Internal Revenue Service? Your little jokes are meaningless, Mr. Neville. Or a doctor or a colonel, whatever it was they called you. I'm a scientist. What the hell are you? Definition of a scientist. A man who understood nothing until there was nothing left to understand. Well, so there is a little light in the forest after all. Guiding light, Mr. Neville. They take Neville to Dodger Stadium, adorned with a nice dunce cap. They tie him to a wooden pile and get ready to burn him alive. At the last minute, the stadium lights are turned on, blinding the family. Dutch, Paul Coslow, a former medical student, cuts him loose and takes him to the woman he saw in the store, Lisa, Rosalind Cash. There's some real 70s tough talking. All right, you son of a bitch, you just hold tight. Up against the wall, you mother. Uh-uh, don't turn, just stand. When I want you to turn, I'll turn you on or off, up or around. I'll turn you. Now cool it. Now put your hands out. Out! 
way out by the shoulder. I like to go crucify you, baby. Now look, you're gonna run this thing, you understand? But I'm the ramrod. Don't screw up. I know how to roll, but it's hard on the elbows. And if you just have to play James Bond, I'll bust your ass. Yes, ma'am. Hit it, they're blinded. Okay, baby, catch up your drawers. Neville and Lisa get away on a stashed motorcycle while Dutch holds the family off. The stunt motorcycle driver is not even close. They travel into the hills where Lisa and Dutch have a clan of children that don't appear to have the disease. But they all have it, but in a lesser degree, like light sensitivity. They go in to see Lisa's brother, Richie, Eric Lanyville, who is close to turning albino mutant. Dutch explains they can turn fast or slow. Neville thinks he can make a serum from his blood. They decide to take Richie to Neville's house to treat him. On the way there, Neville says he has tried experimenting on family members. Lisa stays behind with Neville. One of the little girls asks Neville if he is God. They say the family comes in the night when it's dark. They say they're going to come some night and take Richie's soul and tie it all up in a bag and give it to the devil. Is that really true? Do you know if that's really true? Oh, we wouldn't let that happen. Not a chance. Are you God? No, he is Moses. Neville throws himself into working on Richie. Lisa comes in all dressed up and they have a date. Your move. I just made my move. Lisa tells Neville that her people were part of the family until the family started to turn on them because their disease wasn't far enough along. They just touch lips for the first movie interracial kiss when the lights go out. Neville has forgotten to put gas in the generator. Zachary has a spear and a forty-five hidden under his cloak. He climbs up to the balcony. Neville gets the generator going and comes up the elevator. When Neville sees Zachary behind, he shoots, and for a time, Lisa thought he was going to shoot her. Lisa and Neville kiss and do the nasty. You know, it's been a long, long time. I'm not sure I remember how this goes. In Heston's autobiography, he stated that this was Cash's first leading role, and she was nervous because she grew up watching Heston movies. At one point, Cash told him, quote, It's spooky feeling to screw Moses, unquote. Lisa and Neville start shopping together and acting like a couple. She brings up birth control pills. Are you ready for this? What is it? Birth control pills. <laughs> <laughs> Later, they get medical supplies and draw Neville's blood. They plan on leaving town as Richie gets better. Lisa goes shopping for the trip. Richie, who is now well, gives Neville the location of the family, but he wants him to cure them or kill them. Neville goes to tell Dutch the news, and Richie goes out to save the family. When Neville finds out that Richie is gone, he gets ready to go to war. The family puts Richie on trial, and then they kill him. Lisa changes to an all-white afro and joins the family. Neville races back to his house, and the family keeps rolling cars in front of him until he crashes. He fights his way through with guns and explosives. At the house, Lisa is there, and Neville tells her about Richie's death before he sees she has changed over. She has already let Matthias and his band into the house. The family destroy all of his stuff. We waited for you, Neville, so you could see this. The end. The end of all you've done. You see, none of it was real. It was illusion. Your art, your science, it was all a nightmare. And now it's done. Finished. My brethren, our task is nearly complete. He was the last of those who brought the punishment to us. We have cleansed and purged his world. Now we must build. Build coffins. That's all you'll need. But Neville is too much for them. He breaks free, grabs the blood, and drags Lisa outside. When Neville gets outside, he turns to fire on Matthias, who is on the balcony of Neville's house. Neville's gun jams, and Matthias throws the spear that Zachary left into Neville's chest. In the morning, Dutch shows up with the kids, and Neville is hanging from a piece of art like he has been crucified. Dutch gets the blood, and Neville's last word is Lisa. Dutch, Lisa, and the kids leave the dead Neville behind. There was one bit that was edited out of the film. Lisa, who is pregnant, goes to see her parents' grave to say goodbye. 
While there, Lisa sees a family woman with a dead newborn. When she tells Neville about it, he asks her if she took care of the family member. Lisa said it could be her in a few months, and she did not. Neville is shocked, but he hugs Lisa. World-famous short summary. Family issues break up a couple's happiness. If you enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends. And if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show notes to my site. I have SpeakPipe, so you can leave audio feedback as well. Beware the moors.